smell you'll never forget in your life. And as soon as we walked in that door, we knew. We knew this was gunshot. We knew this was violent. He was a real hard business person. If you had to make a payment, you better make your payment. Everybody thought that. Maybe that's where he gets his money. Everyone wanted to be the one to help solve the case. There's a chasm's difference between a person of interest and a suspect. We already know what happened. And we have the video. Let's get to the truth of the matter. Did you see who shot? Yeah. Is there any chance of me going home tonight? Florida. It's one of our largest districts, but it is very remote. It is a rural community. Beulah is more like a remote on the outskirts of Scammy County, but actually bordered the Alabama line. It's had this rebirth over the last couple years, but in 2009, it was mainly farming. There are pockets of poverty there through all of Escambia County. We, for some reason, have some crazy stuff that happens in this area. I've worked some unbelievable stuff. I was with Sheriff's Office for 20 years and stuff that I've seen and dealt with, some people don't deal with their whole career. I don't know how to explain it or tell you why. sergeant called me and said hey need you to go out to Beulah home out there there's a woman and her husband that they found in the house passed away we're thinking murder suicide husband wife I got briefed on this case it was around 6 30 p.m. it's a pretty prominent family a very very successful local businessman Bud Billings and uh, his wife Melanie he said, you know, they're well known for having special needs children. And he said, we're searching the house now for the children. We think there's eight or nine children uh, still in there. The door has been kicked open. We found out that the call came in from a neighbor. One of the children in the house had heard the gunshots and she ran next door. It's reported that they've been shot to death, so you think that you're probably going to encounter an armed suspect if you run into anyone. Anytime there's a homicide scene and a potential of a shooter still being in the residence, you're going to have multiple units respond. We probably had six or seven units on scene very quickly to search and clear the house. When you get to a crime scene, there's not necessarily a metallic or gun smell or something like that, but death is a smell you'll never forget in your life. You know as soon as you walk in. And as soon as we walked in that door, we knew. And we walked throughout the house and we seen the bodies on the bottom floor in the master bedroom. Of course, it's horrific. A lot of blood, blood everywhere in the bedroom. You see two people shot almost execution stone in the face and the head from a picture of the family we right away know that this is mr and miss billings there was some splatter in other areas of the house but most of the blood was in the bedroom where they were at and we also immediately started looking for guns we didn't find anything like that which eliminates suicide and points more to murder Your first responding officers will secure the scene. They will direct the crime techs, uh, our crime lab people, to specific areas. And they're the ones that actually photograph and measure, uh, look for latent fingerprints. You don't want uh, too many people traipsing through a crime scene. The deputies found shell casings at the scene. No weapons. Any weapons have been taken from the scene. 
as they're clearing a the house, they start finding these kids everywhere. If you can imagine, they're hiding in closets, scared to death. Yep. There was a lot of tension, especially with the deputies and what they had to deal with, just making it safe. Because you're talking about kids that were nonverbal, most of them. They're special needs, they're autistic children and the Down syndrome, etc. Of course, you also want to shield them. After we had gotten all nine of the children out of the Billings household, we found out the Billings actually had two other children, Ashley and Justin, both from previous marriages, and they rushed to the scene. Justin mentioned the videotaping on the compound. He directed us to it and said, we have a video system, uh, you know, the camera set up, and it's also taping. The videotape system covered everything except for Bud and Melanie's bedroom. There was no uh, videotape in the bedroom. But when the crime scene techs show up, they take the videotapes back to the sheriff's office, and you begin an analysis of the videotape. It will take time to go through the many hours of security footage, looking for anything that might help identify the killer or killers. Meanwhile, police continue to process the crime scene and gather as much information as they can about the Billings from the family. Bud Billings was a very successful businessman. He had been in the car business for years and years, and he funded other car dealerships. You know, money stuck to Bud. His wife, Melanie, had a heart for special needs children. And of course, Bud was uh, very supportive of that. He loved children also. So they built that large sprawling compound quite appropriately for all of those children. Now, the family told us that Mr. Billings would carry a large amount of cash around on his persons. He would have a little briefcase type bag that he would carry. And he would also keep a large amount of cash in his safe and people knew that the family tells detectives that bud and melanie kept a safe in their bedroom closet a small safe was removed from mr and miss billings bedroom we didn't see much of anything else missing but it was obvious that the safe was missing out of the bedroom having that sort of cash you would be a target for those who thought they could do you harm at this point we're almost positive the motive is going to be money because of the large amount of cash that Mr. Billings would keep. I spoke to Ashley, and she told us the safe had some family documents in it. It had a couple of small pieces of jewelry that meant nothing uh, to anyone except the Billings family. I think uh, Melanie's, one or two of Melanie's mother's rings were in there, small uh, gold rings. What's ironic is they go in to take the safe, but they took the wrong one. We learned the safe that they needed was upstairs. And there was uh, quite a bit of cash in it. Detectives believe they know why the crime was committed, but they need to determine who is responsible. They start by questioning the only witnesses, the couple's special needs children. Ashley helped us uh, talk to one of the kids in the house. This little girl starts telling us about a red SUV. That was up to understand it, but she told us enough to put out a bolo for a red SUV identifying that vehicle uh, and finding out you know who it belongs to would be our first lead we knew this was gunshot we knew this was violent in a case like this you check out and interview all loved ones they have to be eliminated first justin was jittery acted very nervous blue markham who is married to ashley the daughter of the billings tells us that Mr. Billings and Justin have had issues in the past. Justin, of course, said that he didn't have anything to do with it, so we kept questioning him on it. We went to bring him in and interview him at the sheriff's office. They're all coming to talk to him about craft. No. He wasn't devastated like the rest of the family. He didn't seem that upset. It looked more like a raid than anything else. It was almost an unburdening. He wanted to tell this story. He said, I'll be honest with you, I didn't like him. A lot of people owed him money. If you had to make a payment, you better make your payment. Then we walked to the back, and I'm thinking, I may have a clue here. As 
Police in Escambia County, Florida searched for a red SUV spotted near the home of murder victims Bud and Melanie Billings. They also questioned Bud's oldest son, Justin, whose behavior at the crime scene was suspicious. People handle shock and grief in many, many different ways. Everybody handles things differently. He seemed to kind of like take it in stride, if that made sense. Uh, so what you look for in that case is, okay, uh, can we tie him to other people, places, events, dates? I got a call from Pensacola telling me that Bud and Melanie Billings was just murdered in their home. And I said, what? I just broke down crying. I was worried about Justin. I met Bud Billings when I was 20 years old. He was definitely a charmer. I cannot have children, so... Uh, we adopted Justin. Justin was six when Bud filed for divorce. And I knew that Justin Billings was no way guilty of pulling a trigger or killing his parents. He told us about some of the issues that he had with Mr. Billings. I guess they had a pretty big falling out. To rule Justin out, we had to go through his entire timeline and interview people that he said he was with. Justin tells detectives that he spent the night of the murder hanging out with a friend named Greg. Let's start on Thursday night, saying you know, dinner's, dinner's ready, come on over and eat, so whatever we ate. Got the call from my sister saying that we should, that I need to go back to, to, the, to my parents' house. Something's wrong to get there as fast as I can. Justin not only provides detectives with his alibi, but as the interview continues, he provides them with a possible lead. Maybe you suspect someone who could have done this. There's a guy named Cab that double-cross my dad with car business or, or something. He tells us that Mr. Billings and his business partner in the car industry, Cab Tice, had issues in the past that it had ended on a, a really bad note. And at one point, Cab Tice had even made threats towards Mr. Billings. And when my dad got into a big argument and I was there, my dad was disappointed in him for stealing from him. I mean, he said if he needed money, you could have just asked. You'd have to steal it from me. And then Cab just stormed out. Justin's story raises the detective's eyebrows because they've also heard the name Cab Tice from Justin's sister. Bud ran the World Co. Finance Company, so he had a lot of people that owed him money. Ashley also assisted in running the business. And, and you look for things like, is any in their accounts, you know, somebody still owed Bud money. And Ashley mentioned that Cab Ties did not pay his bills and then, uh, he owed World Co. Finance $10,000. But again, does that rise to the level of committing a homicide? Investigators now need to question Cab Tice, and they begin the work to track him down. As they do that, Justin's friend corroborates his alibi. Justin was at his house for dinner on the night of the murders. Justin's eliminated as a person of interest and never be a suspect. We knew Cab had a car lot in Pace, Florida. When we sent Santa Rosa County deputies to the lot, they get there. It's eight or nine o'clock at night, and Cab Tice in the back of this parking lot cleaning out a red SUV. We made contact with Cab Tice. He admits, yeah. He said, I'll be honest with you, I was business partners with Mr. Billings, and he says, I ended on a bad term, and I didn't like him. He felt like Mr. Billings took him for some money, and he wasn't happy with it, and admitted that um, they were not friendly at all. Cab Tice tells the investigators he's far from the only one to have issues with Bud Billings. All the people that we worked with all loved him and thought he was a good person but then you also you know had the ones that knew his business said that would make your payment as we're talking to cap dice he admits that he probably deserved it that's how cap felt we asked him about the vehicle and a lot he's cleaning out he said yeah i'm just cleaning it out getting it ready to sell right away my partner myself we're like this guy's shaking Everything about it was odd. We take Cap in right away. As the questioning continues at the station, 
Cab insists he had nothing to do with the murders, but what he says only increases investigators' suspicions. Bud Billings never gave anybody anything. That's a fact. His business, Bud Billings, wouldn't give you a dime unless you got 29 cents back. I mean, people hate Bud Billings. What's your thing? suspect uh, but I've got to come with some pretty hard evidence to convince the state attorney that uh, you know we need to arrest you we felt like cab Thomas was um, gonna be one of the main suspects then the video comes in have spent all night examining security camera footage from the Florida home of murder victims Bud and Melanie Billings. In pouring over hours of video, they find stunning images. In the videos, the red van comes down the driveway and pulls up to the house at uh, the front door. And five people jump out. They look like they had hoodies on. The way that these five individuals we came in the house, they went in the front door and back door at the same time, which is a surprise tactic, just like what we do in law enforcement. They come in with rifles and weapons, and it looked more like a, a raid than anything else. These weren't people just off the street trying to rob somebody. These individuals knew exactly what they were doing, how they were going to do it, and got in and out quickly. They were in all black. They had black boots, face masks, long rifles, handguns, military stout. We see them shoot Mr. Billings in the leg in the living room. You see them drag Mr. Billings in the bedroom. There was not a camera in the master bedroom, so you don't see anything that happened in the bedroom. But you see video of this kid watching. What happens in the bedroom is obvious. It's horrific. The video reveals that the home invader's vehicle, described by Billing's daughter as a red SUV, was actually a red passenger van. Billing's girl was right. It was red, but it was a van, not an SUV. So we're like, holy cow. She did see it, and we were wrong, not her. She was trying to tell us it was a red van. But we had such a hard time interacting with her, we didn't know. The red SUV detective saw at Cab Tice's auto dealership does not match the vehicle driven by the killers. And Cab has an alibi. He was negotiating a deal at a rival car lot at the time of the murders. We had felt like Cab Tice was going to be one of the main suspects. But the red van changed everything. So we left Cab. Now we are trying to find this red van. You find the van, maybe you can find some evidence out of it. Maybe they got something from the house, took it to the van, left it there. So we immediately put this red van on the news. The search for suspects began with an important clue, video of a large passenger van seen at the crime scene. We formed a, a very effective partnership with the media. We need to get the max amount of press coverage that we can for this van. We helped the Escambia County Sheriff's Department put out the word. Whoever owns this van is a person of interest at this point. The community's reaction was really the horror of it. I remember going to breakfast at one of the diners and they were talking about, have you heard about this? Did you know Bud Billings? And when the sheriff showed the van, that got the community involved that much more. That day, all of a sudden, everyone wanted to be the one to help solve the case. The next day, we get a tip that a van that matches that description is at a lot behind a shed in the middle of a group of old shotgun houses in West Pensacola. There was a big dog in the yard. And all these big, tough, brave investigators are not going to try to fight that dog. And 
even though the tip said that the van was behind a shed. I couldn't see it. So I don't have enough probable cause to go anywhere other than to that front door. So I go up there, knock on the door, and a lady answers and identifies herself as Miss Brown, a red van that we're looking for in a homicide. And we got a tip that it could be parked behind the shed. She said, well, her husband brought a van home and parked it back there. As I'm sitting there, I look across the living room and sitting there is this brand new box of those boots like we saw the suspect was wearing on the video. Brand spanking new, just sitting there. And I said, Miss Brent, who belongs to these? And she said, well, my husband brought them home. I was gonna throw it away. I said, well, I'm going outside. Why don't I throw them away for you? And she said, I don't care, take what you want. And I'm thinking, I may have a clue here. Then we walk to the back and there's a red van. It's got that funny shape, no tags on it. Some paint's been scraped off like they're trying to conceal some of the markings or whatever. Matches the video. I mean, we're sitting there going, we found the van. You can see where they were trying to paint it, cover up things, where it wouldn't be recognizable. And then we find a burn pit. that somebody tried to burn some clothes in. And then there's a receipt near the burn pit from the dollar store down the road from residence where they had pulped spray paint from the store. That was the color that was on the van. So I went back to Mrs. Brent and said, we think this van's involved. Do you mind if we tow it out of here at our expense? And she said, certainly. Police immediately begin searching for Leonard Gonzalez Sr. It doesn't take long to find him at a friend's house. They bring him in for questioning. Leonard Gonzalez Sr. first came in for questioning originally for uh, tampering with evidence because it appeared that he was trying to paint the van behind his trailer. Uh, not a very smart move on his part. He starts talking about the van, telling him that it's his son's, that it didn't run, hasn't been running for a while. I told him, this is what I found in your fire pit. At this point, I think it finally hit home. He looks me dead in the eye and says, if you guarantee I don't die, I'll talk. Evidence in the home of Leonard Gonzalez Sr. appears to be linked to the brutal murder of Bud and Melanie Billings. Gonzalez agrees to tell police everything he knows about the crime if prosecutors take a possible death penalty off the table. It was almost an unburdening in his case that, that he wanted to tell this story. An actual murder had never come into the conversation. I was under, you say, give us your money, give us your jewelry. And actually, the opposite appeared to happen. How many were with you? Six. Besides you? Correct. So seven though? Correct. He gave us a list of names and he gave us all the suspects. He said that his son Patrick was in the van, along with Wayne Coldire and Danny Stallworth, Gary Sumner, Frederick Thornton, and Regine Florence. As investigators begin checking into the names, a video camera rolls as Leonard Gonzalez Sr. continues telling his story. Junior owns this van. We had enough to bring Junior in. 
Although his father identified his own son as one of the killers, Patrick Gonzalez denies everything. You know about the death investigation? You know about Mr. Bud? Thursday, what were you doing? Just running around, taking care of errands, um, talked to my dad. In fact, I know that it was Thursday because that was the day that he got all pissed off at me, so. Your dad did? Mm -hmm. Hey, he's really sketchy. I mean, he's got some serious, serious issues, so don't, don't take anything he says to, you know, oh my God, this guy's a suspect, because he's just, you know, the guy's got brain damage, you know that. I mean, I don't know if y'all know that, you will know that. <laughs> he's got brain damage. And he says, don't listen to my dad, he's crazy, he doesn't know what he's talking about, blah, blah, blah. Detectives are skeptical of Patrick's claims about his father and shift their attention to the red van. He starts talking about the van, that it didn't run, hasn't been running for a while. You know, he had several different stories about the van. That's not the same van, okay? The thing can hardly move anyway. So you can't tell me for sure this is not your van? Yes, I can. I can you made you sure. tell me right now that you weren't driving it that day. But it, I know that it, that van was there. That, that van was not involved in any crime. When police searched the van, they find nothing tying Patrick to the murders. They're forced to let him go. We didn't have enough to do anything with him at the time. He wound up leaving that day and going back home. At this point, you're just trying to find out what kind of evidence do we have. I started watching the video enhancement. They're wearing their boobs. I got a boot box, but how are we gonna figure out where this box come from? Somebody said Patrick lives out 98 in Santa Rosa County, and across the subdivision he lives in is a Walmart. I said, y'all go to Walmart, because most criminals, they're lazy. They're not gonna go far from the house. Walmart is awesome. They keep documents of everything. They were able to scan it for us, tell us the time that it was purchased. Investigators wind up pulling the video. We start watching the video. You see Patrick Gonzalez purchasing the boots with some other black clothing. And you see three other males with them. Detectives are able to identify the men in the video as Wayne Coldiron, Donnie Stallworth, and Gary Sumner. Three of the suspects named by Leonard Gonzalez Sr. At that point, we're rolling. We got a person of interest that is seen with multiple suspects on the video, and they're buying a high-tech boot which matches the boot box found at a possible suspect's residence. So the dots are starting to come around. Investigation into the murders of Bud and Melanie Billings gets a boost when surveillance video from a Florida Walmart shows the suspects purchasing clothing they're believed to have worn during the crime. There's a chasm's difference between a person of interest and a suspect. We had videotapes of our suspects over in Santa Rosa County at the Walmart when they were purchasing the garb that they wore when they, uh, you know, entered the compound and, and committed the crime. We had enough information to get an arrest warrant. The investigators head out to round up the suspected members of the deadly robbery. Patrick Gonzalez Jr. turned himself in. He was concerned about being arrested in front of his children. I went in and said, hey, let's, let's break this down. What's going on? He swore him down that he didn't do it. He told me about the fact that a lot of people didn't like bird buildings in it, but whatever, because of his demeanor with uh, some of the businessmen and such. He was pretty strong on the fact. He said, I didn't do this. And I was like, but, you know, you were there. I took the notes I had. And I gave it to the investigators, and they took it from there. Then the next day, Donnie Stallworth was arrested. Stallworth actually had left the county. He went to Alabama. We had to have him brought back to Scambia County. Gary Sumner ran an auto detailing shop. Sumner, he had a traffic stop over in Fort Walton Beach. A law enforcement officer, you know, just happened to come onto that, and that's how we ended up arresting him. Wayne Coldiron, he had just gotten out of prison. 
Wayne Coldarm had done time, I believe, in Tennessee for second degree murder. We secured the arrest warrant and uh, went to his house here in Escambia County and arrested him there. With five of the seven suspects in custody and detectives preparing to question them, the remaining two suspects surface. I got a call from a detective in Okaloosa County. And lo and behold, somebody had told on Frederick Thornton and Rakeem Florence. And they were at his office wanting to set the record straight. Investigator Nesmith and his team make the 40-minute drive to Okaloosa County where the suspects are being held. They're both only teenagers. We broke up in teams. One pair took Frederick Thornton. Myself and my captain took Rakeem Florence. How's it going, man? You guys contacted us and wanted to tell us what you knew about the incident at Pensacola, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was scared, you know what I'm saying? Until my mom came to me like, you just gotta break it down to me and tell the truth. He tells us that uh, he was in the van and Frederick Thornton was with him and that they were all promised by Gonzalez Sr. two or $3,000 or something like that to carry this deed out. And they got a truck out with us. We see they got guns coming back out. They got guns? Yeah. Who got guns? Everybody. You know what I'm saying? They come back out and say, if you tell anybody, your whole family is dead. In the next room, detectives hear a similar tale from Frederick Thornton. Tell me what happened. I just, for real, man, I just don't really want to go down for something that I don't really know what's really what's going to go down. We already know what happened, and we have the video. Let's let's get to the truth of the matter. Did you see who shot? Yeah. Okay, who shot? Got you. We got authorization. In jail back in Escambia County, teenager Frederick Thornton keeps talking. We found that when the van left the Billings compound, they drove to Santa Rosa County and they dropped the safe off uh, in Santa Rosa County. It's at an antique mall off of Highway 98. And we had to take the guns and stuff, put it in the uh, It was put in the van that was there at the, the mall, the antique mall when y'all got there, correct? Right? Yeah. And then you see this woman for the first time at this antique shop. Does she say anything at all? Do you hear her say anything? Even if it's, hey, hello, I mean, did you hear her say a word? She just said, did she stand there with Pat next to him or come she back? Walk to the antique shop. Can you, can you give me a brief description? Really don't know. She had long blonde hair. Long blonde hair. She looked older, younger. Older. Older. Frederick Thornton has unexpectedly revealed a possible eighth suspect in the robbery and murder. Detectives immediately begin digging in to find out who the woman is. We found out that Antique Mall that was owned by Pamela Long Wiggins. She matched Thornton's description. Pamela Long Wiggins, she was reasonably successful. She had a very successful real estate business, not only buying and selling houses, but she had rental properties. Pamela Long Wiggins was seen in Gulf Breeze. She was a businesswoman that was fairly successful. Detectives want to know how this successful businesswoman might be connected to the seven suspects in custody and if she played a hand in the murders of Bud and Melanie Billings. You talk about the power of the press. She was all over the news with her, with her photo that, you know, we need to talk to her at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. We believe that Ms. Long has significant and substantial information that we need to conclude this case. I got a call from the Orange Beach Police. Bam, and Hugh Wiggins, her husband, they had taken their yacht from Santa Rosa to Orange Beach, Alabama. They pull up to the dock and they check with the harbor master uh, in the marina. The value of being at Orange Beach is that that marina was probably one of the closest marinas to getting into the Gulf of Mexico. There's a pass right there, so they could get into the Gulf fairly quickly. We learned that they had taken their yacht, which needed some engine repair from Santa Rosa, and had taken it over to Orange Beach, Alabama and they wanted to get it repaired immediately. So the mechanic at the, at the harbor, he was watching the television, as most people in this area were, because they're following the Billings case. Well, up walks Pamela Long Wiggins and Hugh Wiggins, and of course he's doing double takes. He's looking down at the TV, looking up at them, looking down at the TV, looking up at them. And they wanted to pay extra if he could fix their yacht right away. She they left, he immediately called the Orange Beach police and said, hey, uh, that lady that they're looking for over in Florida, her boat is here in Alabama. A 
tip from a yacht mechanic in Alabama helped Florida investigators locate Pamela Wiggins, a suspect in the murders of Bud and Melanie Billings. Based on the location of the marina, police suspect she may have been trying to flee to Mexico. The Orange Beach PD just, you know, moved with rapid speed. They contacted us and verified, uh, you know, that that was who we was looking for. And I, I don't think an hour passed. And they called us and said, uh, how would you like for us to transport her? Late this afternoon, police announced that Pamela Laverne Long, a woman they had identified as a person of interest earlier in the day, has been found and is cooperating with the investigation. As they begin checking into her background, police discover Pamela Long Wiggins' finances aren't as impressive as they first appeared. Pam Wiggins was fairly successful, but a lot of her mortgages and everything were starting to cause problems. We're having trouble making payments. She did need money. 7.10 p.m. Uh, Detectives quickly discover there is a key link between her and murder suspect Patrick Gonzalez. We learned that Pamela Long Wiggins had a rental property that she rented to Patrick Gonzalez Jr. and his wife. Patrick Gonzalez Jr., he did some collections for her, you know, people who didn't pay their rents, etc. And so Patrick would go with a couple of other accomplices and he would collect on the rents. Based on what they've learned about Pamela's financial issues and her connection to Patrick Gonzalez, detectives put together a theory about a misguided crime that turned deadly. This was a money score for Pamela Long Wiggins, and uh, she got Patrick Gonzalez Jr. and this group of people to do what could have been just a simple robbery. But this was a robbery that went horrifically bad. They also took the wrong safe. The small safe that they took, you know, had nothing of any substance. You know, your investigators are really soft. Okay. <laughs> okay. She was condescending, and she thought she'd better than everybody else. Her approach was... I really didn't have anything to do with this, but the investigation shows otherwise. Pamela provided the weapons for uh, the homicide and hid the safe. Pamela will not admit that she's the brainchild behind the robbery, but confronted with the evidence against her, she agrees to a plea deal. Can you tell me where the safe is located? The safe is located. And also the weapons, the guns. did a search warrant on the house. We find the safe in the backyard. Within a little over 100 hours, we had seven people, and we had Pamela Long Wiggins, which was our final arrest in custody. Our folks worked around the clock. There was a couple of junctures where I literally had to order investigators to go home because I don't think they would have left. Everybody worked brutal hours. It is my honor today to tell you, Ashley, and your family, we have found them, and they are in custody. Pamela Wiggins is charged with accessory after the fact. The remaining suspects are charged with armed home invasion robbery and murder. All except Patrick Gonzalez agreed to plea deals, resulting in life sentences for Donnie Stallworth and Wayne Coldiron, and lengthy prison terms for the rest. Patrick Gonzalez, the accused trigger man, takes his chances with a jury. The trial was a zoo because court TV was there. It made it more difficult to get people in and out to testify. After a four-day trial, a jury convicts Patrick Gonzalez on two counts of first-degree murder and armed home invasion robbery. He is sentenced to death. I think what he did is absolutely demonic. To kill people in front of their kids? Who can do that? Gonzalez Sr. died in prison of lung cancer. Pamela, she also died in prison. Patrick Gonzalez is on death row. He still proclaims his innocence. I thank God every day that the people that did it would have been caught. Justice is served.